Good evening, everyone. So delighted to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming to our third in a series on the AJC Global Briefing. Our next and final briefing will be on Thursday, April 2nd, where we will hear also strategies for combat combating anti-Semitism and inviting you to a training in May, after which we will actually send you out into the world to help fight anti-Semitism with our new training. Um, I just want to put a plug in for this Monday night is Purim at Wilshire Boulevard Temple, adults only Purim. Very special uh, Purim spiel with uh, professional singers, actors, and musicians. It's at seven o'clock and it's open to everyone and we'd love you to come. So thank you so much for coming. On behalf of Wilshire Boulevard Temple, I'm Rabbi Susan Annis, Director of Adult Programs. It's my pleasure to now introduce and welcome Rick Hirschhoff, the uh, Los Angeles Director of AJC. Thank you, Rabbi Nanis. Good evening, everyone, and a special welcome as well from AJC. We appreciate your being here tonight, one week after, one week to the day after last week's lecture and a week filled with news that could easily make us want to just stay home and get underneath the covers and call it a day or call it a night. So it matters that you are here and we are, we are grateful for that. Tonight is the third in the four part series of global briefings on anti-Semitism. A little bit of a, a calendar note, we won't meet again next week but we will meet on Thursday evening, April 2nd, and that will be, as Rabbi Nanis mentioned, a, a lesson on best practices in combating anti-Semitism online, on campus, and on both sides of the aisle. This is one that will have uh, tremendous relevance for the way we live our lives and what we see in the world and ways that we can interact in that way. As we've been conducting these lectures, the world doesn't stop, and incidents of anti-Semitism continue, but also glimmers of light and glimmers of hope. If you saw today's New York Times, you may have come upon a story about a group called Guardians of Memory, a group of non-Jews in the Alsace region of France who have taken it upon themselves to clean up Jewish cemeteries, not just to keep them preserved and to honor gravestones that go back hundreds of years, but sadly to clean up the swastikas and the anti-Semitism that continue to manifest themselves and be daubed even today. And this is a group that works quietly but diligently. And I commend the article to your attention because there is cause for hope and optimism. There are glimmers of light. We have some AJC leadership here this evening. Those of us wearing badges, staff members, board members, feel free to ask us any questions to come up to us. This is a conversation that extends beyond this evening and we welcome your involvement in our work. Tonight's lecture, of course, will be focused on anti-Semitism in the Muslim world conspiracy theories, political Islam, and Iran. And our AJC staff, our subject matter experts, Holly Huffnagel and Siamak Kordistani, will share with us the history of anti-Semitism and its manifestations in the Muslim world. Although there certainly are dark moments and chapters in this history, we also remain encouraged here too by some of the positives. Frankly, we wouldn't be doing this work, and I don't think most of you would be here tonight if we didn't hold out some hope for a better world. So there is light, and we see it in the engagement and partnership between Jews and Muslims, especially here in Southern California. There are a few special initiatives between the Jewish and Muslim communities as we come together as individuals not just as organizations, but as people. Ultimately, it's people to people. As we explore our identities, our shared narratives, and 
very familiar shared traditions. You should know that we are also advocating together on the local, state, and federal level to combat hate in this country. Currently, AJC and the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, through the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, MJAC for short, is working to pass the No Hate Act. What will the No Hate Act do? It will improve the hate crime reporting and data collection of the FBI. MJAC, in fact, was responsible nearly three years ago for helping to, to pass another important piece of legislation, the Affiliated Institution Act, which expanded federal coverage or coverage of hate, federal hate crime laws protecting houses of worship to include religiously affiliated institutions like JCCs. Two days ago in La Mirada, here in Southern California, I attended an all-day summit convened by the FBI here in LA under the guise of protecting faith communities and securing faith communities. It was an important day and it was a cross-section of the religious landscape of Southern California. And we came together in unity to protect and to ensure that we are able to worship freely and learn freely and gather freely together. So that's what these laws ultimately turn into, the practical application. We know at AJC that coalition building and partnership is ultimately what leads to change and impact. And with that in mind, we are ever grateful to our friends, our extended family here at Wilshire Boulevard Temple for this series. And it has been an exploration for AJC as well because we're learning. And we're learning and we are grateful to be now having a window into the remarkable social services that are provided to the Los Angeles community through the Karsh Center. So one good collaboration is on the cusp of leading to many, many more. That's what this is all about. And we are, are so appreciative and grateful to Rabbi Nanis for making this so, for inviting us in. Yes. Without any further ado, it's my pleasure to invite to the stage my colleague, Holly Huffnagel. Following Holly's presentation, she will take questions from the audience and odd questions as well to our colleague CMAC Kordistani. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming tonight, Rabbi Nanis. Thank you for hosting. Rick, thank you for your introduction. So I actually don't think I need to start with getting our bearings. I feel like Rick just did that, but this is where we are in the series, anti-Semitism and the Muslim world. What I think is important to realize, and yes, we have one more afterwards followed by a training. So just in your minds, April 2nd is our next um, uh, gathering, uh, talking about online, on campus, both sides of the aisle. It's a practicum, best practice. What tools can we give you? Uh, to better prepare you to fight anti-Semitism, and then followed by this advocacy training. But what I think is important when we look at all of these on the screen right now is that they actually kind of build off each other. And we're going to see that very clearly in the lecture tonight about anti-Semitism and the Muslim world, how it pulls from the far right, from Christian anti-Judaism. So some of the things that I know January 9th was a very long time ago, um, but we're going to be revisiting some of those themes and tropes uh, this evening. So let's begin. The topic of tonight's lecture is anti-Semitism and the Muslim world, conspiracy theories, political Islam, and Iran. I'm opening with a quote um, from a member of Hamas. Uh, Suffering by fire is the Jews' destiny in this world and the next. We are sure that the Holocaust, uh, in Arabic, maraka, uh, which means a punishment by burning, uh, is still to come upon the Jews. And I just want to point, point out the photo. It's an incendiary kite that was sent from Gaza into southern Israel, and it's actually a far right symbol um, on a swastika on the, the kite, blending again these sources of, of anti Semitism. So, before we really dive in, we need to understand what is the Muslim world. It's kind of this vast uh, this space, and it's definitely not a monolith. 
So first we have you know, Sunni Muslims. This is the majority of Muslims, 85% or 1.6 billion people. We think of the, the Arab world, but we also can go into West Africa, Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey. You know, we can't forget about these other actors as well. This was a, um, a tweet, or actually the, um, the uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia uh, tweeted that he liked being called anti-Semitic. This was just in September of last, of last fall at Columbia University. And so again, this is part of, of uh, the bigger picture when we think about the Muslim world. We also have the Shiite community, much smaller, 15%, less than 200 million people. Now the Shiite community is more centrally located, predominantly in Iran. But this map actually kind of shows you in yellow where other groups of Shiite Muslims reside. And when I actually look at this map, I'm reminded when I look up even to Azerbaijan, which is a predominantly Shiite Muslim country, that when we talk about political Islam tonight, we can't group all Muslim countries under that umbrella of political Islam. When I think about Azerbaijan, Kosovo, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, these are Muslim countries that don't fall under this category. So we also have to keep this in mind. This is incredibly, incredibly complex as well. We also have to be very honest with what we're seeing and what's happening. And even though it's controversial to talk about what's anti-Semitism um, within Muslim communities, communities that in Europe are also discriminated against, we have to be honest, we have to state the facts, um, and we have to be open about what's happening. And the first fact that I want to give you tonight and share with you is that the majority of fatal anti-Semitic attacks in Europe over the past two decades have been perpetrated by extremists acting in the name of Islam. Since 2003, there have been over 20 Jews killed in Europe by Muslim or by Islamist extremists. This is a picture of Ilan Halimi. This is in 2006. He was um, a Jewish 23-year-old who was kidnapped in Paris. He was kidnapped because his kidnappers believed that his family had money because you know, he was Jewish and the, the, the stereotype of, of Jews having money. He was tortured when the ransom wasn't given and he died of his injuries. This is uh, 2006. This is also in Europe and, and also in France, in Toulouse, Jewish day school, 2012. When an Islamist extremist purportedly protesting the situation in the Middle East goes into a Jewish day school and murders a teacher, his two children, which are on the, the left, and the schoolmaster's daughter, uh, Miriam. She was actually pulled by her hair and shot at point-blank range and, and died. This is the Brussels uh, Jewish Museum, 2014. Four people were killed. Hypercaché Supermarket, Paris, 2015. Copenhagen. Dan Uzan, the security guard, watching over a bat mitzvah. This is uh, Sarah Halimi. She was 65, an Orthodox Jewish woman, lived in Paris, and she was beaten to death and actually thrown from her apartment window um, by uh, a Muslim from Mali, an uh, immigrant, who s declared that he had killed the Satan uh, when he killed her. This was in 2017, so not very long ago. And then the last picture that I want to share is uh, Mira uh, Noll. She was an 85-year-old Holocaust survivor. She was stabbed 11 times in her apartment, also in Paris, and then her apartment was set on fire. Also an Islamist extremist. This was 2018. Now, this is, I'm starting with the, the reality of, of what's happening, at least in, in Europe. And I want to mention two quick things before we look at why and what we can do. The first thing is that the European, like European, Western European governments were really slow to wake up to this. And honestly, and we can see this in hindsight, it took Islamist extremists reaching beyond the Jewish communities for these governments to really respond. And so there is a direct line from the Brussels Jewish Museum killing in 2014 that targeted Jews. 
to the Brussels airport attacks in 2016, which actually targeted everyone, targeted Western society. When we look at the Paris, the hyper cachet, the kosher supermarket killings, which targeted Jews, that was in January 2015. In November 2015, we have the attacks at the Bataclan, where 130 plus Parisians, French people, men, women, children are killed. Again, targeting Western society. And this is an argument that I mean, AJC has made, other Jewish organizations have made, but you know, the hate that begins with Jews doesn't end with Jews, right? It's, anti-Semitism is this, this poison that tests the health of a society, and we saw it happen in France, that it was reaching beyond the Jewish community. Thankfully, things are being done, measures are being put in place now. Our only hope is that it's, it's not you know, too late, and I don't think it is. Um, that's the optimist in me. But the second point I want to make is here in the United States, when we talk about sources of anti-Semitism, we don't face, and I hope we never do, but we don't face fatal anti-Semitism coming from Islamist extremists. Now we can talk about, and we should, uh, anti-Semitism that might exist, or maybe anti-Israelism within segments of our own Muslim communities here, but that's a different topic uh, than Jews um, being murdered by Islamist extremists. So I want to set the stage at least there. So the question we really need to ask is, is how did we get here? How did Islamist extremism take root in Europe? Why is it rising in the Muslim world today? Uh, what is, is happening? So the plan for tonight, uh, for with the next 40 minutes or so is we're gonna talk about Judaism and Islam. I will not give you a full history, I promise, but there's some integral connecting points we have to mention in order to understand this phenomenon. Origins of anti-Semitism in the Arab world did not start with the Muslim communities. Political Islam, what does that look like with conspiracy theories, how political Islam grew after the creation of the State of Israel, and Islamist anti-Semitism, how is it different than other sources? Iran and its proxies. This is state-sponsored anti-Semitism. We cannot have a conversation about anti-Semitism and the Muslim world without talking about Iran today. And then lastly, responses. What can we do about it? And I hope you at least leave today feeling somewhat empowered and maybe a little hopeful, even though we will dive into the depths of, of some very tough topics. So, the bottom line up front, if you, if you want to zone out the rest of the lecture, please just pay attention to this. This is the one thing I want you to, to remember when we talk about anti-Semitism in the Muslim world. It's a combination, okay, of two things. Religious anti-Judaism and modern political Islam. And I would argue that one without the other wouldn't have the same virulency. And in the Middle East today especially, they go hand in hand. And that's something that's relatively new. This, was, this is 19th century, 20th century to today. Okay, so let's dive in. Uh, Judaism and Islam start off really well. Again, there's not gonna be a history lesson, but when Muhammad um, first came, uh, entered Medina, he encountered Jews upon his arrival. And while most Jews did not live in the Arabian Peninsula, they lived elsewhere and they would not encounter Muslims for even hundreds of years, he did come in, in contact with three tribes. These are the three tribes that Muhammad uh, came in contact with. And he actually really appreciated the Jewish tribes. He admired that they were monotheists. They didn't believe in the incarnation of Jesus or the Trinity. He actually felt that the Jews have so much more in common um, with, with Muslims. And so he modeled, actually, initial Muslim practices after Judaism. So we talk about, mid, I, it's, I think we forget this sometimes, but midday prayers, praying on Friday. Original, early Muslims prayed toward Jerusalem, not toward Mecca. They prayed toward Jerusalem. Ramadan, the month of fasting. The idea of fasting was modeled after Yom Kippur from these, from these tribes. So it's something very important to, to remember. The other key piece here is that the Quran, which is the most holy book in, in Islam, and it is believed to be the actual words of God, of Allah, given to Muhammad through the, the angel Gabriel. The Quran clears Jews from the accusation of deicide. 
I don't know if, the, if you can remember back to January, but we talked about the DSI charge and how Jews were ki uh, accused of killing Christ and how that really went with them all the way till 1965. The Quran clears Jews of this accusation. Um, this is the verse. It actually says they, referring to the Jews, did not kill him, referring to Christ, uh, nor did they crucify him. And for all the trouble we might look at with, it, you know, this, this, I don't want to say clash between Islam and Judaism today, Islam never delegitimized or dehumanized the Jews as Christianity did. You know, yes, there are issues today, but when we look at what happened uh, with Jews in Christian Europe, what they faced, the, the kind of extremist anti-Semitism they faced for almost 2,000 years, that did not happen um, in, the, in the Muslim world. So we have to, we have to also remember that. One of Muhammad's wives was Jewish. Uh, Safiya, she did convert to Islam, but um, she has a powerful testimony of loving Muhammad when he was dying. She was crying over him, saying that she would rather die with him than have him die alone. Uh, and then the Quran also recognizes Jews and Christians as people of the book. Uh, so again, this is um, Al-Kitab al in, in Arabic. This is the verse from the Quran which talks about uh, Jews and Christians really if they love, you know, if they believe in God and the last day and they do good, their reward is coming and they have nothing to fear nor shall they grieve. And this was really codified in something called the Constitution of Medina, which talked about um, this, the Ummah, which is the um, like broader Muslim community, community of believers. But within this Muslim community, there was room, purposeful room for people of the book, Christians and Jews. They were given a special status. It was a lower status than, than Muslims, but it still had rights. They could be in business. They could um, you know, practice their, their uh, various jobs, etc. And this was called the Dimi status. And it was a covenant of protection, legal protection uh, given to, to Jews and, and Christians. So based on what I just said, things sound pretty pretty good. I mean, we, we forget sometimes the, the role that um, Jews played in, in the Muslim, la in Muslim lands, the, the power actually that was given to them, the ability to achieve things. Sometimes uh, even we forget that Maimonides, the great Rambam, was the, a doctor in the court of uh, Saladin in Egypt, right? So this is kind of how high of positions that Jews were given uh, in, this, in this world. So we have to ask, well, what went wrong? Things seem to be going relatively well. And it, we have to go back to Muhammad to, to really kind of understand this. So Muhammad actually became frustrated when the Jewish communities did not convert to Islam. And there was an accusation that one of the tribes actually tried to poison him. A battle ensued. This is a picture of this battle here in the seventh century. And eventually you have those three tribes being expelled from the Arabian Peninsula. And it's at this time that the direction of prayer changes, that you have some of these anti-Jewish verses, which I don't know if some of you here have actually heard that there are anti-Jewish verses in the, in the Quran, and we're not gonna wash over those. We need to talk about them and be honest about them. They exist. Jews as falsifiers, Jews are trying to destroy Islam. That was another accusation. And then the Hadith, which there's the Quran here, and the Hadith is really close next to it, but it's still secondary to the Quran. This is the collected work of Muhammad's deeds, actions, his sayings written down. Um, so the Hadith actually uses um, some terms to, to describe uh, Jews, and the, the latter, especially Yahud in Arabic, is, um, becoming, is being used in a pejorative way. And also, this is kind of where we have this introduction of kafir, which means unbelievers. So, you know, we have the Ummah, the global community, we have Dimi, the Dimi status of protected, uh, people protected uh, of, the, of the book, but we also have kafir. And these are the unbelievers uh, given to people who would deny uh, Muhammad or purposefully try to keep people from, um, from Islam. And so here they are, and I don't want to spend too much time on them, but I want you to be aware. These verses still exist. I mean, um, Muslims will read them and we need to talk about context, etc. So this is uh, from, a, 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 I think, Surah 2. We said to them, the Jews, be you monkeys despised and rejected. And they say, our hearts are covered. Nay, Allah has cursed them. This is according to the, uh, the curse the Jews on account of their unbelief. 
Wherever for the iniquity of those who are Jews, why disallow um, to them the good things which has been made lawful for them, for they are basically hindering many people. This is the idea that um, Jews were keeping people from Islam, keeping people from Allah. And lastly, um, and this was a very interesting one, I think, for me, but it says, um, oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and Christians for friends, for they are friends of each other. Surely Allah does not guide unjust people. So this exists, this text exists, seventh, eighth century. We, we have those verses written. But what I want to argue tonight is that not much was really done with them. Really not until the 19th and 20th century when you have European anti-Semitism imported into the Arab world and as a response to Jewish immigration to Palestine, which was then in the Ottoman Empire, right, late 19th century. And so that's actually what I want to talk about now, because it's crucially important we understand the shift um, in anti-Semitism developing in, in the Arab world. So I said this earlier, it did not start with the Muslim communities. Arab Christians, actually, are the first communities in the Arab world to have documented anti-Semitism. And it, it came right from Christian Europe, and the very one of like, the first cases is actually Christians in Syria. The Syrian Christians are the, the ones that we at least know um, had the first instances of, of, of uh, pretty high-level anti-Semitism. This was a, an affair called the Damascus Affair, 1840. This was a blood libel case. You know, we talked about the blood libel back in January, this kind of medieval ritual murder charge. 1840, an Italian monk and his servant go missing in Damascus. And instantly, 13 uh, like, of, the, of the leaders of the Jewish community are charged with murdering the, uh, the monk for ritual purposes. These 13 uh, Jewish leaders are arrested by the Ottoman authorities. They're imprisoned, they're tortured. And then the local population actually goes and pillages and um, destroys the synagogue, one of the synagogues in Damascus, in response. And what we find is actually this blood libel charge travels to other Christian communities in the Arab world. So we start in Syria, but it comes into Lebanon, it goes into Palestine, to Bethlehem, to Cairo, and, and, and Alexandria, where there were you know, Coptic Christians. So this is actually where we have kind of the birthplace of a quote-unquote modern anti-Semitism in the Arab world. But it didn't just stay within the Christian communities. Um, we actually have Muslim leaders also kind of adopting some of these European ideas about Jews. And this is really in the face of increased Jewish immigration to the Middle East. We, we know we kind of know, we know the history, especially um, in the 1880s, with the first kind of waves of Jews coming to, uh, to Palestine, buying land from the Ottomans. And so this is really in, in, in response to, to that. So the protocols of the elders of Zion, I think Sabah, Dr. Sabah Sumek mentioned them last, last week in, in detail as well as Mein Kampf. I mean, detrimental to, to the, I would actually say, to, to anti-Semitism's um, existence. I mean, well, it's rising because of this in the Arab world. So we know that the protocols, which came from Tsarist Russia, early 1900s, we know that by 1920, the 1920s, there were Arab nationalists in Iraq and in Palestine already quoting the protocols of the elders of Zion. 1920s, before Hitler even wrote Mein Kampf, which he did in 1925. But by 1935, only 10 years later, it was already translated into Arabic. Of course, the anti-Arab passages were expunged. Hitler, I mean, I think they didn't, he, Hitler was also very anti-Arab, but they took that passage out. <laughs> and both of these books, in addition to a book called The International Jew, continues to be sold on the streets of Riyadh and Jeddah and Tunis. And you know, it, 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 these books are very much kind of part and parcel of the Arab world today. And these conspiracy theories are still in existence and have taken on new meaning, especially after the creation of the State of Israel. And this is a quote from, from Adolf Hitler. And I wanna mention it because it's repeated by um, Islamist leaders saying basically that the Zionists, and that's you know code also for, for Jews, have no intention of living in, in Palestine, they are 
moving there basically to create a central organization for their international swindle, world swindle, endowed with its sovereign rights and removed from the intervention of other states, a haven for convicted scoundrels, and a university for budding crooks. Now a lot of it, and this is also protocols of the elders design, conspiracy theories, but what happens actually is we have leaders, Muslim leaders, trying to understand what's happening, trying to understand what's happening to, to um, the, the, basically the crumbling of the Ottoman Empire, where, you know, the, the place of, of um, Arab states, pan-nationalism, et cetera, trying to understand this world in light of increased Jewish immigration. And I actually want to mention about, I want to mention three people, three names. I could give you 20, but I promise I'm only going to give you three, and I hope you at least remember these three. These are maybe the most important three names when it comes to understanding political Islam uh, then and, and now. And the first um, name I'm going to give you is someone named Hassan Albana. Uh, here's a definition of political Islam. Basically, an interpretation of Islam as a source of political identity and action. But Hassan Albana is the founder of something called the Muslim Brotherhood. Is that a familiar, maybe a familiar couple words, right? So, actually quite old. Even before Hitler came to power, the, he started the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 in Egypt. He was an Egyptian imam. And this is the creed from the Muslim, um, the Muslim Brotherhood creed. Allah is our goal. The Prophet is our leader. The Quran is our law. Jihad is our way. Death in the service of Allah is our highest desire. Second name I want you to know. This is Haj Amin al Husseini, also maybe known as the Mufti of Jerusalem. Has anyone here heard of the Mufti of Jerusalem? Okay, a couple of hands. Um, known maybe, you know, most well for his close friendship with some key Nazi uh, leaders, specifically Adolf Hitler. And what he... <laughs> I want to say something like kind of what he did uh, with bringing anti-Semitic propaganda to the Arab world has lasting, unfortunate resonance today. Um, but he, I want to mention how he kind of came into these to the circles and came into to meeting Hitler and other high Nazi officials. He was part of a major coup that happened in Baghdad, 1940. Uh, he helped actually a pro-Nazi government overthrow the British. And when the British came back, in 1941 to reestablish their control over Baghdad, a major pogrom basically against the Jews happened. And this is something called the Farhud. Not as many people know about the, the Farhud, although it took place really during the Holocaust. While the Holocaust was happening in Europe, I mean, yes, this was before the announcement of the final solution, but June 1941. And what happens with this, with the Farhud? We have 180 Jews are killed. A thousand are injured. Here's, this is actually a mass grave of, um, of, the Jewish, of the Jewish bodies after the Farhud has taken place. And Farhud actually means, it means violent dispossession, dispossession. 900 Jewish homes are destroyed, looting of Jewish property. I mean, we, and I studied Holocaust uh, history, and in, in the historiography of the Holocaust, we don't really talk about this instance. Like, we don't really group it in with what happened in Europe. Um, you know, with the Einsatzgruppen or the Holocaust by bullets or the concentration camps. It's, it's not really treated that way, and I want to actually include it a little bit in this, in this narrative um, because it's part of it as well. So, Husseini, after really this situation in, in Iraq, he becomes to be a close friend of, of Hitler and also Himmler. He talks about the connection between Arab nationalism and national socialism and Islamist ideology, saying that um, basically what Hitler's doing for the Jews, he, he lauds, and, what he, and um, how he actually wants to help. Uh, Hitler gives him an honorary title, or being an honorary Aryan. I know we can, it's okay, we, we, have, to, we have to laugh a little bit about, these, about, about this, this conversation. Uh, and the Mufti actually helps spread the Nazi propaganda in the Arab world. So when we still see some of these awful cartoons, and I'm gonna show you a few. It really can go back to, to him. I mean, there were others too. Again, I'm only mentioning three names just for our own memory, but he was one of the, the big leaders. Many are still used today, but against Israel as a Jewish state. This is him meeting Hitler, actually, Alsinian, or Himmler, sorry, June 1943. 
I want you just to focus on the last line. This is from Al Husseini's memoirs, but he basically asks um, Hitler, like, if, if he can help in, in Palestine with the kind of with the final solution. And he says that the answer that he got from Hitler was that the Jews are yours. Okay, I have one more person to mention when we talk about Islamist anti-Semitism, but I need to take a little side note and talk about Muslim heroes, because I would be remiss if we just focused on, on the bad. And the Arab world also was not a monolith, just like Europe. There was vehement an, uh, opposition to Hitler and the Nazis uh, in the Arab world. And we know actually that hundreds of thousands of Muslims, soldiers from Africa, India, the Soviet Union fought against the Nazis in major ba battles um, in North Africa, also Monte Cassino, in Stalingrad. And I think even more powerful, and I only want to share just four names with you, are stories of individual Muslim leaders who actually would risk their own professional careers and even occasionally their lives in one case to individually re to rescue Jews in the Holocaust. And we don't talk enough about Muslims who rescued Jews in the Holocaust. And I just want to mention four names from four different countries. The first is Abdul Hussein Sardari. He's also known as the Iranian Schindler. Uh, he was based in Paris, and he was actually able to rescue all of the Iranian Jews and Central Asian Jews, the Baharan Jews who lived in Paris. His argument was that they weren't racially uh, Jewish, so he, he did use Nazis' uh, quote-unquote uh, pseudo-scientific logic, but he saved uh, the Iranian uh, Jewish community that lived in Paris. Salatin uh, Ulkulman, he was a Turkish diplomat. He rescued 50 Jews off the island of Rhodes. They had Turkish citizenship, and he was able to say that the Nazis you know, can't actually take them and deport them to Auschwitz. So we have 50 Jews rescued from Rhodes. I think of the 2,000 Jews in Rhodes, only 150 survived. It was a really uh, a high percentage of Jews who, who were killed. Uh, King Mohammed V of Morocco, this is maybe a famous case. Maybe some of you know about King Mohammed V of Morocco. But when he was approached by the Vichy officials, he actually said this, well, he's reported to have said this, this line, there are no Jews in Morocco. There are only subjects. And he didn't make Jews wear yellow star or an identifying badge. He also would not allow the Moroccan Jews to go to a concentration camp, in part because of his leadership and also other, other factors. Uh, 200,000 Moroccan Jews um, survived. And then this is the last one, and I, mean, I don't want to say a personal favorite, but it means something to me especially. This is Dr. Mohamed Helmi. I have his photo here. He was an Egyptian doctor, and he was based in Berlin. And this Egyptian practicing Muslim, he actually rescued Jews in his home in Berlin during 1941. So you know, we know what was happening in Berlin in 1941, and this, he risked his life to do this. And he's actually the first Arab to be honored as righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. And this is actually a recent honor in 2013. It took a long time for this honor to happen. So I want us to remember this as we proceed to m more discussions about Islamist anti-Semitism and the one more um, name I want to, to mention. But we, we need to complicate the narrative a little bit. So Islamist anti-Semitism, Again, I have a, just a definition about you know, what an Islamist is, supporter of Islamic militancy or fundamentalism. So what happens is really after the birth of Israel, 1948, an Arab defeat, and the Arab defeat, it's like almost an existential crisis for Muslim leaders, like Muslim religious leaders. Because their, the belief was that the land was given to them by Allah. It was a divine gift. And what Israel represented was something like the revolution of the Dimi. The Dimi is this, you know, the, 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 the lower status. They weren't supposed to have power. They weren't supposed to be in control. And all of a sudden, you have this crisis. Kind of within Islam, what does it mean to have a Jewish state in land that was given to us by God? And, it, and Islamist leaders were actually kind of turned this Arab-Israeli conflict, this geopolitical conflict, into a religious conflict, into a civilizational conflict, again, an existential conf conflict. And it's not between Arabs and Israelis anymore. It's actually between, they'll argue, this is in their arguments, they'll say it's between Jews and Muslims, and it's between Islam and Judaism. It's bigger than you know, what it's perceived, and that's how they're gonna try to get followers. That's how they're gonna try to make a movement out of it that's going to transcend uh, the entire Arab world. That was the goal. 
So jihadist anti-Semitism is an eliminationist, and I'm gonna show you what I, what I mean. So this is the third name coming up. So if there's a three names for you to remember tonight, it was Hassan al-Banna, founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Mufti al-Husseini from Jerusalem, and this man right here, Saeed Qutb. Saeed Qutb was an Egyptian uh, cleric, and he wrote in 1950, again, kind of in response to the creation of the State of Israel, our struggle with the Jews, and even the words our struggle, kind of sounds like Mein Kampf, right? My struggle. A lot of similar language, and it says extermination of the Jews is a religious duty. The Jews are the blackest devil and the source of the worst anti-Islamic machinations. They are the eternal enemy of Islam. They are the evil that plagues humanity, as clearly shown in the protocols. So again, he's referring to an anti-Semitic forgery to, to prove um, you know, his, this, this text. I kind of mentioned this, and I'm gonna go through this a little bit quickly. But instead of Arab leaders looking at their own faults, they were, and in order to like try to return to former glory, they saw themselves as the victim and then they would use anti-Semitic tropes to blame Jews and to blame, to blame Israel. And what we actually see here, 1950s and 1960s, is not for the first time, but it's when it becomes popularized. Pulling from those Quranic verses, remember those anti-Jewish verses I showed? They're being brought to the, to the front, to the light. And they're being used in combination with political Islam, with European anti-Semitism, and they're saying that this conflict between the Jews has been going on since the beginning. And really, this is the first time we're really seeing this. And it's, it's being used to advocate for the destruction of the state of Israel. Again, the Quranic image of the Jew is radicalized, combined with anti-Semitic tropes. So what do I mean by combined with anti-Semitic tropes? Two examples. I've shown this one before in the first lecture just to give you a hint of what was coming. Let's take a look. It's a deicide charge. You can see this, don't kill him twice, but it's not, you know, um, that, you know, someone who's Jewish, it's, it's an Israeli IDF soldier, right? Probably also Jewish, but it's the idea that Israel is killing Palestine, you know, this is the Jesus in the, you know, as a Palestinian. Here, this, uh, the title of this cartoon on the, the right is actually, or, yeah, you're right, is called Palestine, or Palestina, it's a young woman um, being shot through an arrow and a cross by a, a flag of Israel and the United States. Jews are also being seen, again, as, as, as devils, as butchers, as um, uh, like kind of Dracula kind of figures. And a lot of this comes from medieval Christian imagery. And yet it's being reused and recycled in the Middle East today. Both of these cartoons are from the, you know, the last couple of decades. This one's from Turkey. Again, I don't want to forget Turkey in this, in this mix. We're focusing heavily on the, the Arab world, but um, we can't forget about Turkey here. Okay, these conspiracy theories and this Islamist ideology unfortunately is not staying within just the, the leadership level. We also know when it's been translate, it's been going out to, to mainstream society. And I, I wanna just give you some statistics. I won't spend too much time here. I wanna remind everyone if you want this PowerPoint presentation for your own uh, use, you can email us and we can give it to you. Um, but this was a question that was asked in 2000, oh, sorry, 2005, it's kind of cut off at the bottom. It's a Pew Research Survey, 2005, a little dated. I also need to point out it came after the second intifada. So this might, you know, we have to talk about what might color the results. But this group of people, they were asked what their perceptions of, of Jews were on a scale of favorable, very favorable, all the way to very unfavorable. And these are the results. 60% of Turks had an unfavor somewhat unfavorable or very unfavorable attitude, 74% of Pakistanis, 76% of Indonesians, 88% of Moroccans, 99% of Lebanese Muslims, and 100% of Jordanians. And one big, one big issue here is, one, the Holocaust isn't taught in any of these, uh, in any of these schools for, the, for, for, for Muslim uh, youth. They also don't know much about, at all, if anything at all, about the history of Jews in their countries. 
Jews have been living in, in many of their countries for thousands, like, thousands of years, even longer than Muslims. And they don't know this history. And I want to mention them real quickly. This is the Misrahi community. And then I'm actually going to turn this mic over to my colleague, Seamat Kordistani, to talk about um, what's happening in Iran and as someone whose family left Iran as a Mizrahi Jew. So Mizrahi Middle Eastern Jews, this is the Yemen, a Yemenite Jewish community coming actually to Israel. And it's, it's actually, I think, a beautiful picture um, when you see um, Mizrahi Jews coming to basically freedom in, in Israel after facing expulsions in, in Yemen. So we forget sometimes, I mean, we don't maybe as, because um, we're, we know the story, but most people don't know the story of the 850,000 Misrahi and Sephardic uh, refugees that were forcibly expelled or f had to flee uh, their countries after the creation of the State of Israel. And so this is where they've come from, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon, Tunisia, Morocco, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Yemen, uh, Libya, which especially atrocious things happened in Libya, Algeria, and Turkey. And so, you know, I want to actually acknowledge that, you know, those, those communities as, as well. But CMAC, do you mind coming up here now and talking a little bit about uh, Iran and what is happening there? Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about the history of uh, anti-Semitism in Iran the past 500 years, but we're going to go through that very quickly. <laughs> and we're going to focus mostly on the 20th century but, uh, and the 21st century, obviously, but I think you know, we need a little bit of background about uh, Iran because I think up to now, Holly's talked a lot about the history of Sunni Islam and uh, some Arab, Arab anti-Semitism. But uh, in Iran in particular, anti-Semitism has been shaped by um, its Shia background. So uh, contrary to popular belief, Iran was actually not a Shiite country until the early 16th century, the early 1500s. And um, it was converted violently from the Sunni uh, sect of Islam into the Shiite sect of Islam because the rulers of Iran, the new rulers of Iran at that time, the Safavids, uh, wanted to develop an identity that would be a bulwark against the Ottoman Sunni Turks. Turks. And uh, in Shia Islam uh, at that time, and also to a degree in modern times, there is a concept of uncleanliness, the physical uncleanliness of unbelievers, people who don't believe. So not just Jews, but also Christians and other minorities. And um, in Iran, this is called najis. Najis basically means impure or unclean. And so what does that mean? Uh, I actually have uh, kind of an artwork from the Safavid period of Iran. Um, basically it means Jews have to live in uh, sort of ghettos, not the type of ghetto you would find in Warsaw in 1943. But sort of the type of ghetto you would find um, uh, Roma living in, in uh, some European uh, cities in the 19th century, for example. Uh, they couldn't hold certain jobs. They couldn't touch certain things in markets. They often had to wear clothing that ident identified themselves as Jews or badges. Um, I think some of you have heard the term dimmy or dimitude. There was sometimes a, a, a poll tax. There were attempts at forced conversions. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about just uh, my family background. Uh, my grandparents had told me, always told our family that they, um, early on when they were teenagers, before the ba Pahlavi dynasty came into power, and we'll talk about that briefly soon, uh, they were not allowed to touch the fruit in the supermarket. Uh, my colleague Saba would talk about uh, the fact that her grandparents, when uh, there was rain, uh, some Shiite Muslims were not, like, were not allowed to go up to them and touch them or go near them because their impurity was basically coming off. And some scholars think that this was influenced by uh, the Zoroastrian religion, which was the official religion of Iran before Islam. Um, and also, there, there is some elements of, uh, of Jewish understandings of ritual cleanliness that made it into Shiism. 
So that's sort of the, the root of uh, the way some Shiite Muslims view Jews in Iran. Uh, one of the biggest anti-Semitic events in the history of modern Iran, or relatively modern Iran, was the al ahdad which was the forced conversion of uh, Jews in Mashhad. Uh, it was a violent riot. There was a trigger. There had been tensions building up. And um, we don't know exactly the n number that were killed, but it was uh, at least 30. Some accounts are more than, more than 40. Uh, many homes were destroyed. Uh, basically, the entire community was forced to convert en masse into Islam. And a lot of these Jews, uh, these Mashadi Jews, kept their faith underground, kind of like the conversos of Spain. And uh, I think maybe some of you know some Mashadi Jews today uh, live in the New York area, in Long Island, in Great Neck. Uh, there's a smaller, much smaller community in Los Angeles. Uh, although there's a large Persian Jewish community in Los Angeles, there's also some Mashadi Jews that now live in uh, Milan. And uh, so, obviously, some of these people kept their faith after, after many decades. They were able to come back into the, the sunlight when, when the Pahlavi di dynasty uh, came into power. And that is a good segue into the next slide. Um, basically, the big game changer for Jews in Iran was the uh, coming to power of Reza Shah in 1925. And uh, Jews were able to leave the ghettos. They were able to assimilate with non-Jews. They could live, work, and socialize with non-Jews. They were able to take up certain jobs. Um, for example, uh, my mom uh, in the 1960s and 70s, 1970s, uh, worked in the National Iranian Oil Company. Uh, that type of job would not have been open to Jews prior to 1925. So, you know, sort of the major themes from that era that affected Jews and allowed them to be, to come out of the ghettos, to enter the business world, and to become more successful and to become uh, more accepted members of society was the modernization of Iran, the secular, secularization of Iran. And um, the country became more about uh, na a healthy nationalism as opposed to uh, religion. And religion was talked about less so in uh, public spaces. It was more about uh, being uh, proudly Iranian, and religion was more of a private issue. And as, as you all can imagine, that came to uh, a very unfortunate and screeching halt in 1979. Back then, we had a pretty excellent relationship between Israel and Iran. Um, Iran recognized Israel in 1950 and opened an embassy. Uh, they had intelligence and uh, defense uh, cooperation to a great degree. Some of that, by the way, was not necessarily things that you know Israel would like to publicize today because Israel actually did help the Iranian secret service, which had cracked down on dissent. Uh, but on the plus side, Israel did send agricultural engineers to train Iranians with irrigation systems. And um, Iran provided Israel with about 70% of its uh, energy needs, particularly in the form of oil. So this is a really great photo of senior Iranian defense officials meeting with Israeli counterparts at the IDF uh, headquarters in 1975. There were direct flights between Tehran and Tel Aviv. I think there was actually, at its heyday, there were two flights a day, which is amazing. And uh, there were even Zionist organizations that were active in Iran, and there were Zionist youth groups sending kids to Israel. Uh, just something that's completely unimaginable today. Just <laughs> completely night and day compared to the situation we have today. Um, so 1979, big uh, game changer. Uh, and that was really the beginning of the state-sponsored anti-Semitism. So uh, before we get into this, you know, I just want to tell a little bit about my family background um, and how that relates to the status of Jews in Iran today. So when Khomeini came into power, and he was the leader of the Iranian Islamic Revolution, and we'll talk about him a little bit more, Basically, the Islamic government decided that uh, there would be 
a division between certain religions that are considered to be predecessors to Islam and predecessors to the arrival of the Prophet Muhammad and those that came after were very problematic. So for example, uh, Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians were given official status. I wouldn't call them first class citizens, but they were given official status and they're considered people of the book. And uh, Baha'is on the other hand, because their prophet came after Muhammad and because they proselytize, uh, they were not given any recognition. And ba Baha'is have fared much worse than Jews have in Iran uh, under the revolution. They face torture, they face persecution, they face executions, and um, they're not allowed to go to university. Basically, if, you, if you're Baha'i in Iran and you want to have a normal and good life, you have to hide the fact that you're Baha'i. And uh, that relates to actually the second point about proselytizing and conversion relates to the way Iran treats religious treats Christians. So if you're Armenian or Assyrian, you're basically like a Persian Jew or Zoroastrian. You, don't, you typically don't go out and convert people. You're just kind of an ancient religious community in Iran. But there are now evangelical Christians in Iran, and those people have faced death threats. And I think you may have heard about some of these people, like Pastor Abedini and uh, Yusuf Nandarkhani, and uh, th these folks have gotten a lot of attention particularly with uh, uh, evangelical American communities and the Republican Party, if this issue has really gotten a lot of traction in Congress. Um, so, and for that reason, uh, my, my parents and my family, we were able to stay in Iran after the revolution, but life was pretty grim. So, uh, toward the end of the 1980s, my brother was actually <coughs> smuggled out of Iran by human smugglers because at that time there was a war going on between Iran and Iraq. And a lot of the young Jews, uh, especially the males, fled Iran because they didn't want to get drafted into that war. And um, many of them fled through Balochistan, they fled through Pakistan, and with the help of Hayas and the United Nations, they came to Austria, and thereafter, uh, typically, uh, the United States. And uh, it was a harrowing journey, but uh, most people made it. Unfortunately, some didn't. And um, it was, it was a very difficult time for Iran's Jewish community, but many have settled in Los Angeles and New York, some in Europe, and obviously a lot in, uh, in Israel. So, um, I think I'm gonna need maybe two more ones. Thanks. Um, Khomeini. Uh, Khomeini was uh, uh, sending out a lot of red flags uh, early on. Um, Back in the 1960s and 70s, he was putting out a lot of anti-Semitic material. And you'll notice a lot of the stuff is eerily similar to either Nazi propaganda or some of the things we see today on the fringes, the far left and the far right when it comes to Jewish conspiracy theories. Uh, his seminal book, which was called Islamic Government, Velayat Fari, he said, Jews wish to establish Jewish domination. Since they are a cunning and resourceful group of people, I fear that they may one day achieve their goal. And in 1977, two years before the revolution, he said, Jews have grasped the world with both hands and are devouring it with an insatiable appetite. They are devouring America and have now turned their attention to Iran and they still are not satisfied. That was a 1977 speech. But to my earlier point about the status of Jews in Iran after the revolution, in May of 1979, he said, we distinguish between Jews and Zionists. Zionism has nothing to do with religion. So that's kind of the nuanced situation that faced the Jewish community. But of course, there were Jews who were executed during the revolution because they were considered capitalists and industrialists and Zionists. And Habib el Ghanian is one of the most famous ones. Um, you know, this is about Iran's uh, relationship with anti-Semitism today, so we're not going to get too much into what's happened in the past century. But just so you know, as you can imagine, a lot of this stuff is perpetuated today. This is a tweet from the Supreme Leader, Khamenei. He's become a little bit more active on Twitter. Maybe he's gotten some inspiration from our president. Uh, we are not against the people of the U.S. What we are against is the rule of oppression, rebellion, and arrogance. This is a tweet from February 19th, 2020, so just two weeks ago. Today, the epitome of rebellion, arrogance, 
and tyranny is the U.S. government, which is controlled by the wealthy Zionist individuals and corporate owners. So it's kind of basically, he might as well just say uh, Jews, because he's talking about wealthy Zionist individuals and corporate owners. If that's not anti-Semitic, anti-Zionism, then I don't know what is. Um, so that's kind of like a 12-minute rundown of the you know, modern history of anti-Semitism in Iran, but I think that you know, if we wanted to, we can get into it for probably a full course. And I think this is a good segue into our next topic, which Holly's going to get into, which is Iran exporting its Islamic revolution. Thank you, Sia. And this next topic is short. We're only about 10 minutes left, and we will be opening it to question and answers in about 10 to 12, 12 minutes. So start thinking of questions that you might want to ask Sia Mac. He's going to come back up here with me at the end. So um, be thinking of your, of your questions. So now we're going to talk quickly about exporting the revolution. And this is cri critical because when you have state-sponsored anti-Semitism, and Iran is exporting its revolution to other places in the Middle East, anti-Semitism is, is going with it. Now I want to bring this map up because I think it's really helpful. I'm a very visual person. And when we look at where Iran is, in some ways it's actually quite close to Central Asia. And it's also close to the Middle East, but it's not as close to the Middle East as even maybe Saudi Arabia, as Iraq, as Turkey. So how does it maintain power? in the Middle East, and maybe how does it protect its Shia Muslims that are in Sunni majority countries? Through proxies, through backing militias, even government, um, like um, al-Assad's government in Syria, uh, the Houthis in Yemen, etc. This is how Iran is maintaining control and exporting the revolution outward. So just remember these arrows real quick. We're gonna go to um, where these arrows are going. So exporting the revolution really happens through something called the Quds Force. Al-Quds in Arabic is, is Jerusalem, but it's called the, the Quds Force. And it's actually, it's kind of cut off, and I'm sorry about the PowerPoint, but it says the, it's the intelligence arm of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Up until January 2020, um, the Quds Force was, and, the, and the, actually the Revolutionary Guard was run by um, Soleimani, a, a name that we all know now. So this is where the, the uh, revolution is basically being exported to, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Gaza, and Yemen. There are many more uh, proxies and allies, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to quickly run through really a couple. It's Hamas and Hezbollah. The PLO is up there, though, because Yasser Arafat was actually the very first foreign um, diplomat, if you will, to visit Iran after the revolution. And so this is connected, obviously, to, to, to Israel and uh, the Palestinian conflict. And here is a kind of a map of, of terrorist organizations that Soleimani was controlling, whether it be Hezbollah, Hamas, um, the Palestine, uh, Palestine um, Islamic Jihad, the PIJ, etc. And then this last point, and, and I'm going to go through this in the next couple of minutes so we can move to responses and what we can do and ask questions, is spreading of, the spreading of Holocaust denial. We sometimes forget about this aspect, but this is actually part of, of the revolution. Uh, Iran has a policy on the, like really denying the Holocaust that it, that it existed. And it, it's the idea, and it's, it's, it's illogical, but if the Holocaust didn't happen, then Israel doesn't have a right to exist. Right? This is kind of the, the way that they're trying to, to prove this. And so the government actually sponsors a Holocaust cartoon contest for artists from all over the world to make fun of the Holocaust. Um, and it takes place in, in Tehran. It's not annual, it's about every, the last one was in 2016, but it's something to, to be mindful of. Um, here's Arafat to Khomeini, the path we have chosen is identical. This is right after the revolution. Hamas, Ahmed Yassin, um, who again talks about Hamas being funded by private donations, mostly funded by Iran. Um, for a follower of Hamas, again, to enter with serious negotiations, a peace with the Jews would be to be renouncing Allah, renouncing Islam. And maybe this is why their uh, situation is as it is. Um, we do not have a, a partner for peace um, with Hamas. Killing Jews is an act of devotion. And I'm, again, I'm going to skip over this slide, but the Hamas charter is littered with things from the protocols. Mein Kampf, again, these anti-Jewish verses in the Quran. And Hezbollah, and this is kind of why, where I want to spend a, a, another a, uh, minute, is Hassan Nasrallah, this is the, the leader of Hezbollah, which again is the Shiite Islamist terrorist group uh, based in Lebanon, but really operating around the world, and I'm going to get to why that's important. Um, he said that Muslims must use any means at their disposal to kill Jews, for the Jews are satanic. 
They are behind all evil. This is actually a picture I took of a Hezbollah tunnel. Um, I was on a project interchange trip. We take, AJC takes uh, non-Jewish leaders to Israel to actually see on the ground what's happening. This is my, when we think about Hezbollah, we think about them operating in southern Lebanon and it being a huge security issue, which it is for Israel. But Hezbollah is also active all over the world when we think about uh, attacks against you know, the Argentine Jewish community in Buenos Aires, the AMIA bombing of 1944, uh, 1994, which killed 85 Jews. Uh, they have networks in, the European, in Europe, um, in Latin America, even cells in the United States. We know that there are Hezbollah operatives that have actually crossed under the, um, through the Mexico-US border. And so this is a global issue. They, they traffic in, you know, they do money laundering, drug trafficking, uh, weapons trafficking as well to support what's happening in, in the Middle East. And so we've launched a major campaign. And I bring this campaign up because each regional office at AJC has actually taken on a piece of it. And AJC Los Angeles, we launched our Combating Hezbollah campaign. And I think there's some material on your, um, on your seats that, that deal with uh, AJC and Hezbollah. Uh, you might have a printed version of this brochure. But we launched it right here at Wilter Boulevard Temple um, in, in a partnership with uh, the temple and also the Romanian consulate here in Los Angeles, and we had a three-star general come and others speak about what's happening um, with, with Hezbollah. This is also a New York Times ad that, was, that we took out, uh, basically pushing the European Union to, to, why haven't you labeled Hezbollah as a terrorist organization yet? What are you waiting for? Look at the organizations, including the Arab League, including the Gulf um, Cooperation, and others have all, have all labeled Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. And the last thing I want to mention, and then we'll move to responses, is Holocaust denial. This is, a, a, a pres this is from the a president of Iran, um, Mahmoud, the former president um, Ahmadinejad, 2005-2013, who said they have created a myth today that they can call the massacre of the Jews. And here are two Holocaust cartoon contests, the, the winners of previous years. And these were not submitted by Iranian artists. I think, I think it's the one that's the far one on um, the right that was submitted by an artist in Belgium. So it's really part of this is like how they're getting this idea of making fun of the Holocaust out there. You can't really see it clearly, but on this cashier it says show a business. How much money have Jews made up from the Holocaust? And where six million is some kind of arbitrary number. It's horrid. Here you have Birkenau plastered against the wall. This is the security barrier, right, in Israel, saying that basically Israel can get away with anything because they have the Holocaust. They're preventing Muslims from being allowed to pray. This is vehement anti-Semitism, and we're seeing it pushed out of Iran. So we've covered a lot tonight, and I think one thing, we, you know, what to do with all of this information, and I promised I'm going to end with hope, a little hope, but it's, it's how we respond, and I'm, I'm actually won't well, spend too much time going through the responses because I have a short film, it's a one minute clip that I really want to end the evening with before we move to questions and answers. Um, to educate, one well, first piece really is education. How do we educate ourselves, not with just the history, but with the geopolitics, what's happening on the ground. And one way that AJC tries to do this is through missions. We have formal missions to the Middle East, the Gulf, North Africa, Indonesia, not just with staff, we take our lay leaders, we take um, AJ, like basically the AJC family to these, uh, to these locations, and it's not sightseeing trips. We meet with the president, we meet with kings, we meet with foreign ministers, the highest levels of government, to have conversations about um, issues that are important to us. But what happens again with, with these government conversations is also relationship building. And if there's one key piece I want to say on combating anti-Semitism, especially within the Muslim, the, the Muslim world, is this relationship and coalition building. It might sound kind of fluffy, right? So like Muslim-Jewish dialogue, having um, the advisory council, which Rick talked about, so I won't go into. We have a society here in Los Angeles. Um, even Wilshire Boulevard Temple is in partnership with the Islamic Center of Southern California. But I can't stress enough how important this dialogue is, getting to know like the other to build trust, because when you have issues of shared concern, you can actually move things much further. And I say this as someone who used to work for the United States government, we had the most success with the Palestinian, Palestinian Authority's Education Department, Department when we had a Muslim government leader speak out against anti-Semitism. 
someone who was Muslim said, this is why anti-Semitism is wrong, and as a Muslim I can't, you know, and that actually moved the needle in ways that when I worked in the Special Envoy's office to combat anti-Semitism, we could never have, have done. And that's why this relationship building is so important, and I want to show you this photo. This remarkable thing happened because of decades of relationship building. This is, uh, again, I am apologize for the, the cut of the, the text, but Rabbi David Rosen, he's the, the man that's you know, furthest to the left, he's our director of international and religious affairs. He was the first rabbi to ever meet, and this is only two weeks ago, in Saudi Arabia, to have an official visit with King Salman of Saudi Arabia. He's not just a rabbi, though, he's Israeli. King Salman has never had, let alone a Jewish rabbi, in, a, in his official presence, but also an Israeli. This is the result of, it's a marathon. This is the relationship building that, that we're talking about. Um, campaigns, combating Hezbollah campaign, and then the last thing I'm going to mention is engagement strategy when we think about where we're moving, what audiences do we want to reach, who do we want to engage. It's young people. It's young Muslims. It's Muslims in the Middle East, North Africa. And so a, camp a campaign that's recent, as of last month, it's called An Al Yahud, about the Jews. It is a Arabic language online video series. And we have reached now over 10 million people, most of them in, in Egypt, in Gaza, in, in the West Bank, um, Lebanon, Syria. I mean, it's incredible because you can, you can see the analytics of where the viewers are coming from. And the, these stories are about, well, Muslim Jewish history, friendship, shared commonalities. Who are the Jews? What do we really believe? And so we're actually seeing movement of uh, maybe the next generation of Muslims having an education that they haven't had in the last 50 years. And that's really exciting. So I'm going to close with this, this last slide. It's uh, two, script two scriptures, um, one from the Talmud, one from the Quran. You might know the first one, it might look a little familiar. Whoever saves a single life is considered by scripture to have saved the whole world. But maybe you don't know about the Quran first. If anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all mankind. It's the same thing. So with that, I'm actually going to, we're going to close with a short clip, and then we'll turn to question and answers. We're here in a place of incredible destruction and loss. This was a history-making day for a group of Jewish leaders and Muslim leaders from around the world to come together and affirm our common commitment to remembering the past and fighting for a better future is something very special. Your responsible leadership demonstrates the power of speaking up and standing in solidarity with people outside one's own community. AJC is proud to be a friend and ally to Muslims of goodwill from all around the world. And if you want to defend your community, and if you want to fight anti-Semitism, and if you want to fight for your well-being, you have to fight for the well-being of all communities. That is what we have done and what we continue to do. لا شك أن هذا اللقاء سيحمل رسالة مهمة للعالم فقد اجتمع الجميع من مختلف المذاهب والأديان ليكونوا يدا واحدة في مشاعرهم وفي عزيمتهم. The mere fact of sitting together, think about it. We can actually bring God deeper into our lives. كما نسأله سبحانه وتعالى أن يجعلنا مفاتيح لهذا الخير وأيضا مغاليق لهذا الشر senior um, uh, Muslim delegation to ever visit uh, Auschwitz and this was just this last January for the 75th anniversary so at this time I'm going to see Max already up here but I'd also like to call my colleague Abraham off um, 
who is Associate Director of AJC Los Angeles, uh, to come to the stage as well. Uh, Ganit's uh, grandparents are Syrian Jews, and so with Sia's uh, Iranian background and kind of my historical knowledge when it comes to anti-Semitism in the Muslim world, we will be your team to answer your questions. And so what I'd like to do actually is collect two or three questions at a time, and then we can answer them collectively, and then we can extend it to more people. So we have, I think, about 10, 10 15 minutes. So uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, and Melissa will be one of our, our mic runners. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> this is my first time here. I haven't seen the, the previous pre presentations, but um, I noticed the list of the uh, sessions that you had, and one thing which was missing there was anti-Semitism that comes from the Jewish, American Jewish community itself. And I want to point out an article I just wrote today, read today at, from the American Thinker, Dot com. The name with God is testing American Jews. They are failing. And it's just very sad that nothing is being said about uh, the, uh, what are Jewish, uh, what are called uh, Jews for Palestine, I forgot what it is, SJP, um, all kinds of okay. other, I'm sorry, my memory thank is you. Yeah, Thank you for your question, thank you. sir. Thank you. Interesting to hear uh, how well Jews fared under the Shah, but the Shah took power after the overthrow of Mossadegh, who was overthrown with, I guess, partly with the uh, cooperation of the CIA. How did the Jews fare under his rule? He was only in power for a couple of years. Do you know? Okay, perfect. Well, we'll take one more question and then, and then we'll answer for it. Thank you. Perfect, okay, thank you. So we had a question about anti-Semitism coming from the American Jewish community. Um, Seema can answer the question about Iran and then we'll return to the question that you asked about, about Europe. Seema, uh, do you wanna start actually with the Iran question? Thank you. Sure, so actually the um, Mohammad Reza Shah was installed by the Allies who removed his father during World War II. And so, from toward the end of World War II until 1953, Mohammad Reza Shah was in power. When Mossadegh came, he was briefly out, as you mentioned, but then he was reinstalled after a coup by the uh, CIA and MI6, and then M Mossadegh was out. So Mossadegh, as you mentioned, was in power for a brief period of time, um, and Part, part of his tenure, the Shah was around, and part of his tenure, the Shah was, was gone. Um, the Jews weren't very much affected by Mossadegh's rise to power. There were some indications that maybe relations with Israel would change a tiny bit, uh, but those were very early days in the state of Israel anyway. Um, and uh, there wasn't any indication that Mossadegh was an anti-Semite or anything like that. But, uh, the, you know, the Jews were a little nervous. But it was just, it was a very short period of time, so. I can do the Europe question quickly and the, the tough one with about the of the American Jewish commu uh, community can be left for the end. <laughs> uh, so in Europe, of the, of the 20 maybe Jews that were, that have been killed in the past 15 years, predominantly it's from Sunni um, Islamists, uh, usually through ISIS recruiting, the most of them have been connected in some way to ISIS, especially the 2016, uh, 15, and 14 attacks in Europe. There was also was a lot of self-radicalization, though, that was happening online. So some of these were lone wolves, like the Toulouse killing, for instance. I mean, not really necessarily affiliated with, with a group. However, um, we, Hezbollah, I mean, it, was, it, it attacked in a, a bus, actually, in Burgas, Bulgaria in 2012 and blew up the bus, and Israelis were killed, and uh, the bus driver was killed, and that was done by Hezbollah, which is a Shiite uh, group as well. So predominantly Sunni, uh, maybe a few Shiite, and that just could be with population uh, size. But th yeah, thank you for your question. And who wants to answer the... <laughs> the, the I, I, I'm not Jewish, so I feel like I shouldn't do a... a, a 
to answer that, but. You want to try? I, th I think we've, we have said, uh, I think we've said before it's possible to be Jewish and anti-Semitic at the same time. Um, but I don't think we discount that. I think there is a concern about some of the folks on the fringes playing into the, ha the hands of the narratives of, of some anti-Semites. I, I, th I think I, I definitely agree with the argument that some of the critics of Israel that are so far to the left and they're so far on the fringes, they sometimes do peddle tropes about Jewish power. Um, but you know, we have to be very careful when, when we're dealing with that. That's, that's a very sensitive topic. Uh, and I'll add is that we don't necessarily have great statistics about Jewish Voices for Peace, which I believe is the organization that the gentleman was referring to. But with that, what we're seeing is that it does cater to a younger demographic. So we're looking at people between the ages of about 14 to their early 40s, okay? So about 35 to 38 in that age group. And what we're seeing is that they are finding commonality in a narrative within the BDS movement. They see uh, Israel and with that Jews as oppressors and really we're seeing this whole entire narrative of a switch of between the Goliath and the David where the Jewish community is being seen as essentially the Goliath rather than the David and so Jewish Voices for Peace it's it's really happening often on a college campus which is something that we'll tackle more so in the next session uh, so the question is are they anti-Semites or are they a little confused regarding the narrative and what the BDS movement actually means uh, so like I said, we don't have great statistics and information, but that's kind of where it stems from. And thank you for bringing it up. Well, we can certainly try to tackle it further next week, or I mean in a month or so, not next week. Thank you. We'll do another round of uh, some more questions, maybe. Um, last week, last session, um, you were, uh, when we were discussing uh, movement towards discussion and AOC um, and see whether or not whether or not there was movement to educate her um, and educate some of um, um, Ilan Omer and and to educate some of our legislators. Um, I was wondering we, we were going to talk about it this week, so can we talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, I'll come get it. We'll do that. One. Your last visual relating Muslims and Jews interacting and coming together, I'm struck by the Spanish Inquisition. 12th, 13th, 14th, prior to the 15th century, the Muslims that ruled Spain, the Jewish population, whether they're architects, the doctors, the builders of the Alhambras, they were inextricably interwound together. What happened prior to the Inquisition that this relationship dissipated? No, prior to, the, prior to the Inquisition, the Muslims and the Jewish population in Spain they were inextricably interwound together, building Spain as a very prominent country in the world. There was no mention, at least I didn't hear it, about anti-Semitism in the United States. What do we do about Louis Farrakhan? No mention about him. And second is, one of the comments, one of the st statistics indicated that there are 100% anti-Semitic in Jordan. I find it hard to believe that since Israel and Jordan are so close to each other. start with a few, maybe kind of touch on all of them, and I can pass the mic to my, to my colleagues. So Dr. Slava Sumek did mention AOC, she mentioned Ilan Omar, um, and maybe Rashida Tlaib as well. I, we, AJC, we have a national um, office in, in Washington, D.C., a government affairs office. We do political outreach with these offices. In fact, I know our director of political outreach actually is very close with the uh, chief of staff of Elon Omar. So we do coordinate. We do help with the education. They are actually, I don't know if all three of them are, but at least two of them are part now of the House Bipartisan Task Force on Combating Anti-Semitism. 
And to be part of that task force, you actually have a, have a commitment to work toward combating anti-Semitism. So I, I don't think this is going to happen overnight. I think this is going to be a longer conversation. But yes, our office in Washington, D.C. is working with these congressional offices. And I'm happy to, again, report further updates on their, on their educational journey, if, if you will. So thank you for bringing that back up. Um, I'll, I'll mention quickly Louis Farrakhan. He, he, we did talk briefly about him last week. I don't know if you were, you were here. And we talked about um, anti-Semitism coming from the parts of the African-American community. And we looked at the Nation of Islam, we talked about Louis Farrakhan and what he's called Jews as termites, et cetera, and we vehemently opposed that language. In fact, it was because of even the Women's March leader's connection to Farrakhan that it ended up, the, the leaders actually had to disband because of charges of anti-Semitism connected to, to Farrakhan. So again, it's very important to mention the Nation of Islam here in, in, in the United States and things that he is saying uh, continue to call them out as anti-Semitic and atrocious. And co your comment on the, hundred, do you want to comment on Louis Farrakhan? Well, I was just saying, we, we, were, we were active in naming and shaming the Women's March co-chairs who were cozying up to Farrakhan. And a lot of other people were too, and, and that's why they were pushed out. Uh, and then the 100% of uh, Jordanians who, in this survey, said that they had either a somewhat unfavorable attitude toward Jews or a very unfavorable attitude. I guess when you say that you have a very unfavorable attitude, you know, would that make you an anti-Semite? Most likely, but this is also self-reporting. Um, I had to look at the survey. It's Pew Research, so Pew does usually does a, a, um, a, a laudable job at collecting survey data. Uh, I have to look into what the exact questions that were asked for that for that number. But again, the population that they surveyed, which I think was 5,000 people, which is actually a high number. You'll need 1,000 for high-level data. 100% came back saying, and so maybe it was 70% saying somewhat unfavorable and 30% unfavorable, but I don't know the, the, the disaggregation. Uh, and with Spain, um, I, I, I'm not an expert on uh, the relationship between uh, Jews and Muslims in, in Spain. I, I know that they work very closely together. I also know that when the Inquisition happened and when they were all kicked out, of Spain by Ferdinand and Isabella and, other, and continuing. They actually had, because of that shared experience, were able to recreate um, in Morocco and North Africa some of that, that, that same partnerships and they continued to live in peace and, and work you know, together. So I think coming from Spain into North Africa, it, it, that, that relationship continued positively um, really up until the, the 19th uh, century. Uh, a quick, quick question about um, Malaysia and Indonesia. How and when was anti-Semitism introduced into those countries? Our dentist uh, has a similar story to having been uh, taken out of Iran in the uh, trunk of a car and, and then eventually to Germany and eventually to Israel and then eventually to the United States. So he practices here. He still goes back to Iran to visit his father, and he tells, he, you know, one of the ongoing confusing things to us is he says it's all fine, that they are very good to Jews, that they keep the synagogues. So I would like some comments, because he's the only person where I've ever heard that from. The materials used in public education in Islamic and Muslim countries um, contains repeated and pervasive anti-Semitic images, language, etc. What's being done to change that? Uh, 
I'll tackle Malaysia and Indonesia. So let's actually start with Indonesia. Uh, most people do not know this history, but actually during World War II, uh, the Japanese were asked by the Nazis to essentially take the Jewish population that existed in Indonesia, which was mostly Iraqi and Dutch Jews who had arrived there uh, due to trade routes already from the time of almost Marco Polo, actually. So it's quite an extensive history. And as most of us know, Iraqi Jews made it all the way to today's Myanmar. So they were throughout Southeast Asia and Indonesia as well. And uh, what we saw within Indonesia is that oftentimes during the war period, uh, the Indonesian, which was not officially Indonesia yet, but rather a Japanese occupied territory in that area of the world, were put in work camps as Jews. And so with the founding eventually of Indonesia as an official country, some of that remained. But most of what we see today is that Indonesia oftentimes sees Jews as Israelis and Israelis as Jews. They're one in the same. And so their anti-Semitism oftentimes derives from this idea of the occupation. They see a lot of uh, identification and they can really uh, feel as if they're part of this plight of what the Palestinians are going through within Israel. And so today, essentially, what we're seeing is that most Indonesians don't actually know what a Jew is, what a Jew looks like, but they do know this narrative of Israel and Palestine. And so they hodgepodge that together, and the anti-Semitism is often stemmed with anti-Zionism. And AJC is doing quite a bit in Indonesia today. Uh, what we're doing is we're encouraging unofficially diplomatic ties between the state of Israel and Indonesia. Most people are not uh, aware that there's this underlying economic ties between the two countries. Countries. And we're hoping that in the years to come, through the work of relationship building, which Holly talked about, that we'll see more and more engagement between Indonesia and the state of Israel. Uh, the Indonesian government wants to play an active role in brokering peace between Israel and Palestine. Uh, why not help to encourage that a bit? Is that essentially what we're doing in terms of, of AJC? As for Malaysia, I have to admit that my background is not that extensive in, in that particular country. Uh, but I would imagine, similar to places like Vietnam, where a little bit of anti-Semitism exists, uh, it has, again, to do with this convoluted idea that Israelis are Jew all Jews are Israelis and all Israelis are Jews. And it's uh, really uh, kind of this connection back to the plight of the Palestinians in the occupied territories. To answer a question about Iran, uh, th there are eight to 10,000 Jews still left in Iran. Uh, they keep a very low profile. Uh, they certainly don't walk around with uh, Israeli flags. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, if you keep a low profile, if you're not active in politics, if you don't criticize the government openly, and uh, you're not Baha'i, and you're not an evangelical Christian, you can get by fine in Iran. Um, that doesn't mean it's fun to live there or exciting to live there as a Jew. And uh, you know, it'd be suffocating for a young person or a young woman in particular to be there. Uh, but people go back to visit their family. And uh, actually, my mom's uncle just won an award in Iran um, for being, uh, for, he's actually a movie producer. He actually he won an award in sort of like a Tehran film festival. And, uh, sorry? Yeah, so um, there is still Jewish life in Iran, but it's very uh, depoliticized, and it's, uh, they kind of have to walk on eggshells, so. The movie was an Argo, no, yeah. And you, know, you can't really make political movies in Iran anyway, so any, anything that's produced for mass consumption is, is apolitical. I'll uh, close this out with the, the textbook uh, question. Uh, I will start first by saying what the governments of uh, the North African and Gulf countries are lacking in, in textbook uh, fairness vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Jews they are maybe making up for in uh, renovating Jewish synagogues. Uh, there have been so millions of dollars spent by Arab countries to renovate synagogues for Jewish communities that really no longer exist. So we wonder kind of what is this educational purpose of, of, of these buildings. One is um, in Egypt that just opened in sure. 2020, uh, in Alexandria in, in 2020. 
textbook thing is still a huge issue. It's one of the AGC's major talking points when we meet with the high, highest levels of government uh, in our missions to push back against the stereotypes of Jews. And it's not necessarily, when we talk about defining anti-Semitism, it's not just about a hatred towards Jews, because they'll also argue like, oh, well, no, we don't hate Jews. But when you look at the images, it's, it's the conspiracy theories, right? It's the pa global power, the money, the control. Those can be equally as dangerous, and that's the perception of Jews. And that's why it's important to connect the perception of Jews also with hatred under that anti-Semitism umbrella. I want to close with a story which I actually alluded to earlier, and I think this is a good way to let you, let you go. Um, but when I worked for the US government, uh, I worked for a special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. He was Jewish. I also uh, was part of an office that had a special representative of Muslim communities. Uh, and he, he, was, he, was, he was Muslim, uh, Pakistani Muslim uh, who lived in, who, who was from Texas. We had a meeting with the Minister of Education in the Palestinian Authority. And this is not classified information anymore, but when my boss, the special envoy who was Jewish, was trying to push back on these textbooks, saying there's anti-Semitism in the textbooks, on your websites of schools, this is anti-Semitic. The, the minister said, no, no, this isn't anti-Semitic. This is, this is what's happening here. We want to educate Palestinian youth. And we really couldn't get anywhere. And it wasn't until um, the special representative of Muslim communities came forward and said, no, actually, this is anti-Semitism. And as a Muslim, let me explain why. And he started explaining it to this minister. And you actually felt that the room changed, that the tone of the conversation changed. And I don't know if he was just saying this to be nice, but he, the minister actually said, Actually, I can see that now, that you pointed that out. And I will actually work with the school in trying to remove um, these images from these particular textbooks. And that's just one anecdote, but it, it again gets to the point that when Muslim leaders speak out against anti-Semitism and Jewish leaders speak out against Islamophobia, um, those coalitions are actually more powerful. So, continued pro progress, so thank you. <laughs> Until April 2nd. <laughs> we will see you, yes, yes, one moment. I just want to let you know that next Wednesday we'll be doing a premiere of a film that will be opening at the end of the month called Resistance. It's brand new with the director and the producer. It's about a young Jewish Frenchman who ended up joining Resistance and saving hundreds of Jewish refugee children and his name was Marcel Marceau. And it's the story of the young Marcel Marceau and you see him becoming a mime through the story. It's free, it's next Wednesday at 7.30.